Hello, BookTube. It's been a bright, sunny, warm, spring-like week here in Boston, but nevertheless, the 1st of October is right around the corner. <laughs> and that is the time when uh, BookTubers do two things. They do September wrap-ups, where they, they talk about all the books they read in September and what they thought of them. And they also do October TBRs, where they list all the books they plan on reading in October and talk about them a little bit and I love those videos. I love them for separate reasons but I love them. I never miss one. Uh, but I can't really do them on this channel. I, not without abusing your patience to a far greater extent than I even usually do. Uh, I can't talk about all the books that I read in the month of September uh, because it was a lot. It's too many to fill one video and I likewise can't talk about all the books that I have read or intend to read and write about in October because that also is too large a list. So what I tend to do on this channel is not so much a TBR as a TBR BY, a to be read by you, where I look ahead to the month of October, or any month, in this case the month of October 2019, and I make 10 recommendations of books that are coming out. You're going to see them in your bookstores, you're going to see them in the new release section of your library, and I can recommend them. I strongly recommend them. Uh, and I have I have the trusty iPad here, though <laughs> actually I haven't said that in quite some time, have I? I do indeed have a trusty iPad. I, I mentioned Oh God, it was a long time ago that my, my old trusty iPad, a delightful iPad 2 that I had for well over 10 years and it worked like a workhorse, like a charm, but it eventually died. It eventually just started going wonky and I was waiting forever for simple things and it wasn't taking a charge and all the ways that an, an old piece of technology is, has to tell you that it's time and it's time to let go. <laughs> uh, and, and of course, this being YouTube, I immediately whined about that on this channel and said I need an iPad. If one of you has a relatively, you know, workable iPad that you don't use anymore, maybe, you know, you've upgraded, uh, feel free to send it to me. Uh, and bless your heart, one of you did send me, uh, with the best of possible intentions, sent me an iPad even older than the one I had that was dying, an, an original iPad. I had an iPad too. One of you sent me an original iPad, uh, the first model, the, and, and, uh, I understand the reasoning behind that because they're these are workhorse machines they they really don't they last a long time uh, and that one was fine for a little while and it gave up the ghost <laughs> I think it was just ready to give up the ghost anyway uh, and then just recently uh, another one of you said, you said you know what about this how about I send you an, this iPad it appears to be a much newer device than the, than either of the ones that I had before uh, and it's light as a feather I believe it's an iPad Air uh, and so I'm back to having an iPad, and boy, oh boy, it feels like having a limb restored. <laughs> I forgot how much I love this particular piece of technology for all the things that it can do, not just that it's great for taking notes. It, it's great for composing prose. It's great for writing emails. It's great for watching videos. It's great for a whole lot of things. Uh, so I have a list here uh, on the Faithful iPad, the new Faithful iPad, uh, and I broke it down by category of books that I want to recommend to you for October. Sort of like if we went to a, a new bookstore in October together and we're just walking around the new release tables or the new release areas of the different subjects I could point these things out to you so uh, the first category is science and nature now I've got two books that I want to recommend the first one is by Eric Aspaugh I'll list all these down below uh, I don't have any uh, pictures I didn't want to trust things too much <laughs> to, to trust the technology too much I'm still getting used to this thing uh, but I will leave everything annotated down below. And I do have one prop. There was one book that I absolutely could not help but show you. Uh, but for Science and Nature, the first one is by Eric Aspaugh, and it's called When Earth Had Two Moons. And it's a really engaging look at a whole bunch of uh, the current science on early cosmological formation, early Earth formation, what the early solar system was like. And uh, you, there are books like that every year, but this one is done really well. It's, it's written in a very accessible but not at all condescending style so I, I really recommend it uh, and the the other one in science and nature is by Stuart Russell and it's called human compatible uh, and it's another in what in 2019 has been a small flood of books on AI on artificial intelligence and this one is about the familiar horror story of AI that grows out of control AI that starts to teach itself things starts to rewrite its own programming and suddenly isn't isn't answerable to its human creators anymore. Uh, and this author takes that science fiction threat seriously enough to write about it 
and what would need to happen. What needs to happen about artificial intelligence anyway, even if that scenario isn't true, there still need to be some fundamental changes to how we think about these things and also how we create them. A very, very engaging entry in the growing library of how we deal with AI uh, that uh, wasn't chatty and it wasn't alarmist. It, I, it struck just the right tone, I thought. Uh, and that's good because a lot of the books that are about the threat of AI or the potentials, the ominous or otherwise potentials of AI, uh, can't get over treating it as a kind of at-heart silly question. And it is not. It is very much not. There is no aspect of your world that is not touched by AI. There is no aspect of this interaction, for instance. This interaction is made entirely possible by AI. But it's not just that. It's lots of other things, too, from the changing of the traffic lights on a street where your children play to the dispensing of medication for your grandparents. It's, it, so I'm glad the author takes the subject as seriously as it should be taken. Uh, then we'll move on to fiction. Uh, well, there are two things that I want to mention to you when it comes to fiction. The first one is reprints, uh, but it's done really well. It's from Lions Press, which is I, I, they're not a press I'm overly familiar with, but I got a copy of this book. It's called Being Sherlock, and it's edited by Ashley Polisek, and it is an anthology of Sherlock Holmes stories. It's a, so in that sense, it's something that we've seen a million different editions of in the last hundred years. It's a selection of Sherlock Holmes stories. It's a really good selection. There aren't any there aren't any dud stories that are picked. Uh, but it's lavishly illustrated with with uh, production stills from all the various film and TV incarnations of Sherlock Holmes. And uh, I like that. I like the combination of those two. Uh, so I want to recommend that. I don't know Lions Press. I, again, I'm not familiar with them, so I'm not sure if you'll see it in your bookstores. But if you want a really good uh, printed anthology of, of Sherlock Holmes stories, this is a really good one. The best one that's shown up this year. Uh, and then the other piece of fiction is something we saw on this channel just recently. It's a novel called What is Missing by Michael Frank, who did a memoir about his own family. Uh, but I believe What is Missing is his first novel. And it's incredibly good. I read it the night that I got it and was blown away. Uh, it's the, it's, on one level, it's a fairly contrived-seeming story about uh, a woman who is, who is uh, trying to... She's in Florence, and she's trying to reconcile herself with the fact that she will never have children. And she meets a, a uh, young super hottie, a teenage young super hottie, uh, who's an avid photographer, and they fall in love. Uh, both of them sort of pushing against it a little the whole time. They fall in love. But the boy is in town uh, because his father, who is a doctor, is at a conference, and his doctor specializes in late pregnancies. He is, he is a fertility expert. Uh, and... When the father and Costanza, the woman, when they meet, something there's a chemistry that happens between them as well. I wouldn't call what actually happens in the book a, a standard love triangle, but it's immensely adult. Not in, not in the dumb or the cheap sense of that word. It's an immensely mature piece of fiction. And when I was reading it, not only it's beautifully written, absolutely beautifully written, but it's also... When I was reading it, I was reminded of how seldom I read fiction like this. It reminded me of fiction from the 1940s instead of the 2019, where not only is most fiction so primary color and so spoon-fed to you, but also most fiction is, we've talked already on this channel many times, of the subtle and insidious bleed-through of YA into adult fiction. This, what is missing is a very adult novel. It was the word that kept coming up in my mind over and over again when I read it. I am gripping right from the beginning. I, I really can't recommend it highly enough. Uh, and that that is fiction. Then we're going to move on just briefly to uh, a category of literature and translation, because <laughs> I couldn't leave this out. Uh, and this is 20 Years After by Alexander Dumas. This is a sequel to The Three Musketeers, and it's translated by Lawrence Ellsworth, who has been doing Dumas translations for years now for Pegasus books, and they are great. His, his translations are fantastic. It's he, not only, in some cases, like The Last Cavalier or The Red Sphinx, he's not only translating these things, he's reconstructing them into new and definitive versions of themselves. It, but it's not only that, it's that he has a flair, he has a knack for Dumas, for the, the stuff that Dumas is doing on the, on the page. Uh, so any Lawrence Ellsworth Dumas 
I'm going to recommend to you. And this one happens to be a sequel to The Three Musketeers. Most of you will be familiar, at least in outline, with the plot of The Three Musketeers. And it's covered in the book anyway. So you don't have to worry about, if you, for some reason, haven't read The Three Musketeers, you don't have to worry about that when you dive into this. You're still going to enjoy the heck out of it. Uh, and then we'll move on to uh, general nonfiction, something that that is neither biography nor history, strictly. And this is a... I won't say it's a polemic. It's not actually a polemic. It is instructive, and it's very personal, and it's charged, but I, it, it, it isn't quite a polemic. It's more like a lecture. It's by Stanley Fish, a renowned academic who is electrifying, he's controversial, he's extremely opinionated, he's, I think, a, a marvelous writer, and his new book is called The First, and it's all about the First Amendment to the United States Constitution, what it is, what it isn't, what it covers, what it doesn't cover, what it can be construed to cover, how it has been recently or in the past abused. An amazing legal discussion, just amazing throughout. Uh, even if you don't end up agreeing with every one of Fish's constructions on it, and you won't, because he, he rather he rather prides himself on being you know, an opinionated author with whom you will not agree all the time. Even if you don't, though, you're going to learn a lot, first of all, about not only the First Amendment, but the, the Bill of Rights. And also, you're going to have all, a lot of your presumptions challenged. It's just a terrific, terrific trot through uh, the First Amendment. Uh, then we'll move on to uh, to kids, <laughs> and that's the one I want to show you. It's by Ma Matthew, uh, it's by Mike Wonutka. And it is a sequel to a book that I've already praised on this channel. Uh, this is Croc, Croc and Turtle, Snow Fun. This is the sequel to Croc and Turtle. Uh, the, in the earlier book, uh, these two friends are competing with each other to see who will who will have who is the greatest at such and such things. Uh, Croc turns out to be a bit of a bragger, uh, and he's constantly outdone by a whole bunch of other animals when he says, "I'm the fa the fastest runner. I'm the highest jumper." Animals that are much better at those things come along and just outdo him. Uh, and it ends up being, uh, the first book ends up being a very touching little book about friendship, about the kinds of things that friends care about with other friends and the kinds of things they shouldn't care about. Uh, and this, we our, our team comes back and it is it is winter and it is snowing. It's cold. And this is a, a little parable in the way that good kids books always are. This is a little parable about uh, cooperation, about getting along with friends. <laughs> and there you see, I, this, I open this at random, but that is the uh, the debate under <laughs> undergoing here, is that uh, Turtle wants to spend the winter inside, and Croc wants to spend it outside. And they, they alternate in the course of the book, trying different things. They'll do outside activities, and Turtle will be miserable. They'll do inside activities, and Croc will be miserable. And the idea at the end of the book is, will they compromise? And they do, and it's wonderful. It's touching. I loved it. Uh, I, and I think it comes out early in October, so it would be right, right perfect for you to get it and then tuck it away somewhere as a Christmas present. Uh, then we'll move from kids, na a fairly natural progression, we'll move from kids to YA. Uh, and uh, let's see here. Uh, for YA, I want to recommend two things. One of which, at least, I believe we've already seen on this channel. First one I want to recommend is by Lauren Shippen, and it's called The Infinite Noise. And it's about a, a boy in a high school, you know, a, a sports star, who is an empath. He is not like other people. He can feel the emotions of everyone around him, palpably. Not, not in the sense of guessing that someone's mad. He can feel it even when they're trying to hide it. And it, it's something that he's been dealing with for a long time, and it, it, it's, uh, it has him on edge at all times. And there's one person in the high school who he meets that, uh, whose emotions feel just right. And we know, therefore, that that might be the beginning of a relationship. But that extra element, that kind of science fiction element, really adds to the story of Boy Meets Boy. It really does. Uh, and Lauren Shippen writes it with a, just the right amount of complexity it's the perfect kind of YA where you, after a while you're just absorbed in the story. You forget you're reading YA, and I like that. That's the kind of YA that I like. And if, uh, if that's true for The Infinite Noise, it's even more true for the next one, which is Cursed, which is the one I think we've seen on this channel. It's by Thomas Wheeler and the comic book legend Frank Miller, who apparently had a hand in plotting it and writing it and who illustrates Cursed. There, there are color and black and white illustrations throughout the thing that are fantastic. And it's kind of an uh, Arthurian take it's uh, it's an Arthurian story. It's not really a gender swap 
on the Arthurian story. It's about a young woman who encounters Excalibur before Arthur does, and she encounters Arthur before he encounters the sword. She encounters the whole world of Arthur's mystical predestination as a great hero before all that stuff happens in the in the, the unenlightened England of before that happens. And it's terrific. It really is. It's it's a uh, could have been so cheap. It could have been such an easy book and instead it is terrific and doesn't read like YA at all. It, it's it's very jagged and raw and violent in ways that I don't associate with a lot of YA. I completely forgot the, again, I completely forgot that this was YA. The characters don't act that way at all. In their world, in their Dark Ages Britain, the, no one is allowed to act like a, the typical teenager in a YA book. So, so uh, I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. A lot of Frank Miller fans are going to get it anyway because they're completists about his artwork. Uh, but uh, I hope they read it because <laughs> it's, it's a genuinely good book in addition to being beautifully illustrated. Uh, and then we'll move on to the two categories that I like the most. Uh, first one is history. Uh, and the first one I want to bring up, I think we may have seen it on this channel, it's called to, uh, to Begin the World Over Again by Matthew Lockwood. And it's a look at the American Revolution, but it's unlike any other look at the American Revolution that I've ever seen. The author has a thesis, he has a theory, that the American Revolution, both the start of it and the conclusion of it, had disastrous negative ripple effects all over the world. The people who tried to, to emulate it and failed, the people who drew the, long, the wrong lessons from it, and also from the after effects that it had on Britain and France in their long world and great in, in encompassing struggle. Amazingly good. I don't there are a couple of conclusions the author comes to that I don't agree with, but if you're interested in the American Revolution and that period of history, this is it's it's like nothing you've ever read, and you really should read it. Uh, uh, then the next one is uh, much more focused. It's by Nicholas Bucola, and it's called The Fire Upon Us. And it's about, uh, well, the linchpin is one particular public speaking event, but it's also, it's broadly about James Baldwin and William F. Buckley. And not only the two of them, although their personalities are captured perfectly throughout the book, just perfectly. Baldwin is fairly easy to do, a very complex, very intelligent character, but we, so much is known about him, and he has been, he has been, studied and revealed so much that he is easier. Buckley is much harder to do and this this author, Bucola, does them both fantastically well. But it's not just that that part of it is wonderful. It's also that the author does a really skillful job of showing how those two people were the keyholes through which much broader worldviews were accessed by whole swaths of the American public. Terrific just terrific. The way that happens, that could easily have gone wrong, and it doesn't. It doesn't. It's wonderful. Uh, then the next one is one that we we, uh, we saw on this channel, and I, I read you all about the pub sheet, as we do in our mail halls, uh, and I had a whole bunch of problems with what looked to be the book's premise. It's by Walter Scheidel, and it's called Escape from Rome, and it's about how uh, the best thing the Roman Empire ever did for the world was fail. And that that sort of a tagline bothered me because I don't think there are many ways in which you can logically say the, the Roman Empire failed. Uh, and that strand of the book, the book is all about empires, and it's all about the long shadow of concentrated power. And that strand about the Roman Empire failing and that being a great thing for human history turns out to be not the only strand, and I would say not even the prominent one. Most of it is about the discussion of... Uh, the after effects of the concentration of power. Terrifically done. Terrifically done. Even at the end of the thing. I mean, it's not, a, it's not a short book. But even at the end of the thing, there were still plenty of things I was disagreeing with the author about. Plenty of them. But it was invigorating. Like to be in the world over again. It was invigorating to think about all those things when it's handled so well. Uh, and the last one that I want to mention for history. I've mentioned it on this channel before. I've praised it on this channel before. This will probably be the last time that I mention it. Uh, and that is Big Wonderful Thing by Stephen Harrigan, his big, gigantic, thousand-page narrative history of Texas, which might sound like the ultimate in uh, keyhole history. It might sound like, okay, this is a specialist, regionalist thing. I would understand why every bookstore in Texas would have a copy, but I'm in Norway, so I'm not interested at all in the history of Texas. Take my word for it. This author knows you're out there, and he's writing this book for you. He's writing it for everybody. This Talk about a, a story about 
the, how republics are live and die. It's, it's just full of great writing, fantastic personalities, and actually a dramatic through line, even though it's a work of nonfiction. So I know that it's a stretch, but I'm, I'm going to recommend it one more time. Big Wonderful Thing, A History of Texas is amazing. <laughs> uh, then we'll go to uh, my own favorite uh, genre, which is biography. There are three uh, big biographies coming out in October uh, that I'm going to recommend to you. They're brutal. <laughs> they're, they're big and they're detailed. They're not, they're not frothy light biographies at all, but nevertheless, uh, they are terrific. They are the beginning of the onslaught of big fat biographies that we will see, that we always see every autumn. The first one is the new book by Edmund Morris, who did a trilogy about Theodore Roosevelt that was brilliant. And he also, in my opinion, did a, a brilliant book on Ronald Reagan, Dutch. I think is a brilliant book. Uh, and there's all sorts of critical disagreement about that, but I can back up my case. I think it's an amazing thing, whatever it is. It's, it, was the, it was meant to be the authorized biography of Ronald Reagan. It certainly isn't that. But whatever it is, is beautiful. Uh, so Edmund Morris is, you know, I'm, I would read anything that he wrote. And his new book is a gigantic biography of Thomas Edison. Uh, and it bristles. And it's, it's very much not a saint's life. Uh, and it's it, it's engrossing. Th those of you who have read Edmund Morris will know what it's like to read this guy. He he doesn't take any minute of his narrative for granted, so it just rolls along, and there is no there is no info dumping. Uh, so that's one of the season's big biographies that I, I strongly recommend. Another one uh, <laughs> another one that I strongly recommend uh, for October <laughs> is. Uh, uh, it's Peter Longridge, is, it's the English language translation of Peter Longridge's enormous biography of Adolf Hitler. And it's one of two. There are two enormous biographies of Adolf Hitler this season. I realize that's a lot to ask, because he's not... Hitler is horrible company on the page. So it, it's very tempting to read the Wikipedia entry on him, and that's it. Let it go with that. Longridge's his book is incredible. It is. It will, it will probably stand as the final word on Hitler for a long time. Uh, in that sense, if you're a big reader of biography, you kind of have to read it. I, <laughs> I, I shouldn't sound so equivocal. I thought it was just spellbinding, as the reading goes. Longridge is fantastic. I've read everything he's written that's been translated into English. Uh, and this is more than Hitler's story. This is, I mean, it is Hitler's story. And not only that, but it's slightly revisionist. It, it, it the, this author wants you to remember that Hitler, uh, was terrible at delegating, that he was suspicious of delegating, that everything about his world was created by him. So the, some of the fashionable ideas about him uh, that have come and gone over the last 30 years, that he was you know, busy fighting the war in the East in his mind, or that he was partially out of the loop when it came to the Holocaust, or anything like that. This author has no patience with anything like that. Hitler was Hitlerism. Hitlerism was Hitler. Uh, so it's not. It's not only that. It's also that it's this. This author is just a terrific writer. Uh, and then the other big biography. Uh, if anything, I was bridling at it more than the Hitler book all throughout. This is by. It's by Elizabeth Cohen, and it's called Saving American Cities, and America's Cities. And it's about Ed Logue. It's about an architect named Ed Logue, who never met a wrecking ball he didn't like. So when I started this book, I, when I opened it, the, the, the advance copy, when I got my first advance copy, I laughed out loud, thinking, oh my God, you're not, you're not actually going to t try and write a heroic biography of Ed Logue, a modern day vandal, someone who, who, when you look at how ugly major American cities looked in the late 1960s and early 70s, when you look at them and you say, oh my God, <laughs> what were they thinking? This looks like a parking lot. That's Ed Logue. That's his dream. That was his vision. Whether it was directly by him or whether it was being copied by some other architect. So I thought I went into the book thinking, "Oh come on, <laughs> I have I have poured in concrete opinions about this guy," and uh, the opinions didn't quite change. But Cohen does an incredible job. It's just an incredible biography. I couldn't resist it after twenty pages, even though I was resisting it. <laughs> it's just that good. Uh, so. I, I'm going to recommend it. If you're interested in that in mid-20th century American history, especially if you're interested in architecture, this is the final word on both Ed Logue and his, for want of a better word, artistic legacy. This is just a necessary book. I, I can't believe that I put it on a list like this, but nevertheless. Uh, and that's it, aside from 
one book that I want to I want to set aside as the book of the month, uh, and it's it's unintentional on the part of Yale University Press. They hit a, they hit a home run for timing, and it's unintentional on the part of the author as well. No one involved in the genesis of this book could have guessed how timely it would be. The book is by Allison Stanger, and it's called Whistleblowers. <laughs> it's a history of whistleblowing in the United States. How it's always excuse me how it's always been viewed how it was codified into law, what have been some of the major cases, what's been some of the major results. Uh, and it just happens to be new, uh, you know, coming out into bookstores. I, I think its date is in the first week of October. I think it, it, it just happens to be coming out into bookstores after the American political world has been thrown in complete upheaval by a whistleblower account. Uh, and it, that that coincidence alone would be enough to put it on this list, but I'm also here to tell you it's a terrific read. It's the, I would have I would probably have recommended it anyway, <laughs> but but it couldn't be it couldn't help but be the book of the month. <laughs> so so there you go. That is a TBR BY for October 2019. Just a few books that I wanted to recommend to you and bring to your attention. I will list them all down below. Sorry for the length of the video, but these these TBR BYs always go long. Uh, and w w I'm going to wrap this up for now, and we'll just launch into October together. <laughs> so so I will see you then. Thank you, book two.